millions of gallons of fuel burn up in Albany. But the big story on Action News, Robert Fadden has been charged in the deaths of the Severcool family in Susquehanna County, as well as a number of other charges. Diane Smith was at today's arraignment. She just returned a few moments ago. We'll have a report later in this edition of Action News. Causing the remaining two units to overheat. Well, that resulted in something of a minor fire in the school's boiler room this morning. And as a result of all that, a whole lot of high school students didn't have to put up with high school today. Lori Vitaliano has more on the story. Like the sign says, school did open on September 3rd, but today, a mere five days later, UE students had an unexpected day off from classes. The problem began shortly before 6 this morning when a maintenance man on routine check of the building spotted smoke coming from a panel that controls the building's air conditioning in the boiler room. Lori Vitaliano, Action News. When our Monday evening edition of Action News continues, Libus and Young get set for a debate this evening here on TV 12. And we'll have the latest on the commuter Broome County dispute. Stay with us. Robert Fadden went before the arraignment and Diane Smith was there. Smiling broadly and waving at spectators gathered in a park across the street, Robert Bo Fadden was led to Magistrate Marjorie Wheaton's courtroom just after four. He wore the same t-shirt and jeans he's worn since his arrest in North Carolina and shuffled along, his feet chained, wrists in handcuffs. Inside the courtroom, Fadden sat quietly, chatting and joking with his police escorts, calling a detective by a nickname and commenting on his long service to the county. Police officers called him Bo. He seemed relaxed and did not cause a disturbance as he reportedly had in North Carolina. At one point, he turned around and gave me a big smile and a wink. He was charged with three counts of criminal homicide, one count of attempted criminal homicide, one charge aggravated assault, two charges of burglary, and two of theft by unlawful taking. No bail was set as is customary in murder charges. On his way out, he spoke quietly with police officers and retorted angrily when a television reporter asked if it was true he'd confessed in North Carolina. Mr. Pine, we understand you made a confession in North Carolina. Well, next thing you know, you guys phone. will have my goddamn head on a platter. You know that? Turn around. Fadden's being taken to the State Correctional Institution in Dallas, and a hearing date has been set for September 18th in this court in Montrose. For Action News, this is Diane Smith reporting. John Lindsay, who hired both Meyerson and Holtzman during his term as Big Apple mayor, is trying to make a political comeback. But this has been a hard-fought campaign as far as Republican voters must be concerned. Certainly the D'Amato Javits slugfest and also the one between Libis and Young should attract a few voters. On the Democratic side, there's really only one race for them to focus their attention on. Maybe that will bring out people as they consider the U.S. Senate race. Kerry Donovan, Action News, downtown Binghamton. Well, as Kerry said just a second ago, the two Republican candidates for county executive are also winding down their primary campaigns. The overriding issue during the recent primary campaign has been taxes, specifically property taxes. Both Libis and Young maintaining they will keep those taxes low if elected county executive. Libis points to his record as mayor, indicating taxes have risen 68 cents a year since he entered City Hall. Young says as a county lawmaker, he has kept county taxes down, decreasing them by 30% over the last four years. The two differ substantially on the role of the county's industrial development agency. Libis would like to see more IDA involvement in commercial ventures. Young is less political in his campaigning, admitting his interests are in government, not politics. Tomorrow, the registered Republicans in Broome County will decide which man they want to represent them as county executive. Phil Fairbanks, Action News. Tonight, Action News will broadcast a live debate between Carl Young and Al Libis. That debate can be seen here on Channel 12 beginning at 7 o'clock. When our report of Action News continues, Steve Lehrman has the word on the Watkins Glen Grand Prix and the Holiday Inn Arena moves toward expansion. Stay with us. Had a string of nice days lately. The weekend was gorgeous. Today wasn't too shabby. And what does your crystal ball say <laughs> of the weather? It depends on what you call good weather. If you don't mind fall weather, you won't mind the rest of this week because we're going to be a little bit more like fall. In fact, it looks like a little bit out now. Some of the trees 
especially in my backyard where winter comes early, <laughs> they're, they're beginning to turn already. And of course, that is not due to the cold temperature. you keep your cooler out there, that's why. Hypnotizing yourself thin tonight at 11.30 on The Best of Donahue. From Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now for Action News, here is Diane Smith. Good evening. Tioga Park may reopen. Friends help build a new life for fire victims, and the scene of a fatal fire is probed. But the big story on Action News is a major fire before dawn that leveled two buildings in Waverly's business district. Action Newsman Jay Purdy was on the scene this morning and filed this report. The fire was discovered just after 4 a.m. when a Waverly policeman spotted flames shooting from the rear of the country woodshed bar on Fulton Street. Firefighters tried to confine it, but the flames raced through the four-story building and spread into the adjacent Simon and Abrams Furniture Warehouse at the corner on Broad Street. The three-story structure was topped by the landmark Village Clock, which toppled over shortly after 6. When the furniture building went, part of it crashed into the company's newly acquired showroom next door, causing more damage. Firefighters and bystanders moved the remaining furniture out of the building and emptied the threatened Waverly Free Library. In all, seven fire departments responded with about 200 firemen. The rubble is still being watered down at this hour. Several firefighters were hurt, but none seriously. Jay Purdy, Action News, Waverly. This afternoon, the still-smoking ruins at the corner of Broad and Fulton Streets resembled a wartime bombing scene. Piles of bricks iced over with columns of smoke still rising from them marked the place where the landmark clock tower stood for over 100 years. But Fire Chief Ron Keene was counting his blessings. And that was our main concern, is trying to protect uh, which would naturally go on into the other buildings. Most of the 25,000 books from the Waverly Library were tossed into the Gibbs Insurance Agency across the street where they are drying out today. Residents who gathered to watch the cleanup seemed stunned by the devastation, and they wondered what the empty space in the downtown area would do to business. The mayor said that he would be looking for some federal grants to try to rebuild the town. The fire wiped out two businesses, but its lasting effect on the town will be through the disappearance of the clock tower. Said the mayor, we'll all miss it, and so will all those who pass through here. The Tioga County Fire Investigation Team is still working to determine the cause of the blaze in Kandor yesterday that took the life of 28-year-old Ronald Pitcher and his 12-year-old son Dante. His wife Ruth and two other children escaped the flames that struck their Honeypot Road mobile home. Funeral services for Mr. Pitcher, who worked at Morse Chain in Ithaca, and his son will be held Tuesday morning. Another family was a lot luckier when fire struck their home. They all got out alive, but without any possessions. But people are trying to help, as Lori Vitaliano reports. When this fire struck in Shenango Forks a few weeks ago, the Richard Sekulish family was left homeless. Sekulish and his family of five did have insurance, but not nearly enough to replace all that was destroyed. So Robert Story, owner of the Parkway Tavern on Upper Court Street, held a benefit to raise money for the Sekulish family. Story's band, Tupelo Troop, along with several other bands, provided the music, and the event included a raffle and clothing donations. About 300 people came to the benefit, and anyone wishing to contribute money or clothing to the family can contact Robert's story at the Parkway Tavern. Lori Vitaliano, Action News. And they raised $450 for that family. A 50-year-old painted postman was struck and killed by a car while walking along Indian Hills Road near his home last night. State troopers say Douglas Coleman was killed instantly after being hit by a pickup driven by 18-year-old Ronald Smith of Camp Bell. Smith apparently couldn't see the man who was wearing dark clothing. 25-year-old Gary Spencer of Waverly escaped injury last night when his car stalled on a railroad crossing in Owego. Spencer climbed out of the car before the 106-car Conrail freight train struck. The accident happened at Strong Crossing. Renowned violinist Elmar Oliveira and his associate Sandra Robbins are moving forward on their plans to create an internationally known music festival in Binghamton. They have approached the city of Binghamton about the use of the abandoned Riviera Theater, formerly the Stone Opera House. And today they met with arena manager Paul Gamsby, who suggested the forum as a home for the festival. My basic idea about 
the Riviera Theater was to have a permanent home for a summer music festival, which eventually will be necessary. And uh, that's still the kind of uh, hope that I have for a summer music festival. And uh, it seems that uh, really the only the only uh, discussion we've had so far about the farm is uh, as a rental. So there, there are many things for me to think over. Oliveira seems to be leaning toward the Riviera as the home for his music festival, but at this point he has no idea what it would cost to refurbish. He's waiting for word from the mayor. Cornell has a winning team. More on that in a minute. What makes a hearty meal that's high in protein? Mm. Snow's New England clam chowder. It makes sense. Snows, with all its protein, makes a meal that makes sense. In fact, Snows itself has as much protein as the milk you add to it. So together, they make a hearty dish that's high in protein. It makes sense. Snows New England clam chowder. Snows makes a meal that makes sense. Who's that? It's Farfel. You have any great tasting Nestle hot cocoa mix, friends? Sure. We love Nestle cocoa. <laughs> it's rich, creamy, chocolatey. Marshmallows! Or without. And sweet and just right, sweetie. <laughs> Reminds me of the song. No. Oh, and the S T L E S. Nestle makes the very best. Delicious cocoa from Nestle. What's that little beauty? Volkswagen Scirocco. On a racetrack? On a racetrack. Jump in. Is it quick? <laughs> it's quick. Uh, watch the wall. What, what, what are you doing? Just trying to show you Scirocco is a sports car. Well, it's a sports car. It's a sports car. Want to go around again? Volkswagen does it again. Family. Every Saturday morning, my men go fishing. And every Saturday night dinner's the catch of the day. And or I'd a French fries. Week after week, I never know what they'll catch. But I do know that week in, week out, I can always count on or I'd a French fries tasting good. America's favorite fries. <laughs> or I'd a French fries. They'll never take you by surprise. When it says or I'd a, it's always all right at. The NCAA basketball playoffs continue to defy every odds maker in the country. The Hawkeyes of Iowa spotted Georgetown a 14-point lead this afternoon before coming back in the second half to shoot 71% from the floor and upset Georgetown's Hoyas. So Iowa moves to the Final Four. In Houston today, the Louisville Cardinals were locked in a close game with LSU until Louisville's Darrell Griffith broke loose with 13 points in the second half and Louisville buried the Tigers. Louisville is one of the pre-tournament favorites, but even this win is an upset because Louisville was ranked fourth while LSU was ranked second. So Iowa faces Louisville and Purdue duels UCLA next Saturday for the right to play in next Monday night's championship game. The Cornell hockey team was welcomed back to Ithaca today by about 100 fans who gathered at Lina Rink. Last night, Cornell's big red hockey team beat Dartmouth 5-1 to, to win the ECAC Hockey Championship at the Boston Garden. The big red came into the tournament ranked 8th and had to beat the top three teams in the East to win the title. That victory assures Cornell of a berth in the NCAA National Hockey Championships later this month. Raymond Floyd sank a 20-foot chip shot on the second playoff hole today to win the $45,000 first prize in the Doral Open Golf Tournament in Miami and to spoil Jack Nicklaus's chances for a comeback. For a while, it looked as though Nicklaus would win his first tournament since 1978. And in the NBA, Ray Williams scored 38 points this afternoon to pace the New York Knicks to a 133-124 triumph over the Washington Bullets. Toby Knight backed Williams with 27 points. Elsewhere, it was Milwaukee over Kansas City, San Antonio downed New Jersey, Golden State defeated Utah, it was Atlanta over Indiana, Houston over Detroit, Los Angeles beat Phoenix, and Denver is beating San Diego, but we don't have a final score there. And in exhibition baseball today, Baltimore creamed the Yankees 7-1. to one. A group of horsemen wants to reopen the Tioga Park quarter horse track. And a group of investors met yesterday to talk about that. Jay Purdy was there. 
The group is now going under the name of Tioga Racing Incorporated, and while some aspects of its organization remain to be worked out with the Securities and Exchange Commission, its founders are optimistic everything will come out in favor of the opening day target of June 19th. Wally Spear, who had guided the track during its last season in 1978, was named general manager for this year. A board of directors was also elected. The application for raising dates is expected to be filed with the state in about a week. Jay Purdy, Action News, a week ago. A beautiful day today, but what's up tomorrow still to come on Action News. Now there's something new to go with your Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburger, a garden fresh salad from Wendy's brand new salad bar. Make your own salad from ingredients chosen fresh every day and served crisp and cold with six delectable dressings. Have a salad with your favorite Wendy's hamburger and french fries, salad with chili, or salad any way you want it. Just try Wendy's salad bar today. Thanks to the Dale Carnegie course, I'm a more positive person than I've ever been. This has helped me do a better job at work, and it's helped me to meet new friends. Through the Dale Carnegie course, I've learned to take a more active, positive role in my own life. Now I'm in control. Increase your poise and self-confidence in the Dale Carnegie course. Learn to speak more effectively. Discover and develop more of your hidden abilities. For more information, call Collect. 1-607-724-1874. That's 1-607-724-1874. Jean Marie McTeague, age six hours. And along with Jean, you get weeks of sleepless nights, months of dirty diapers, and a lifetime of responsibilities. Nationwide can help you handle those responsibilities with life insurance for you and every member of your family, even the new ones. And knowing you're prepared for Jean is what our blanket protection is all about. Nationwide is on your side. Strong and Sunbeam, it's the family bread. Naturally. When my family plays, they play hard. Work up a big appetite. Well, they don't always eat the way they should. That's why I'm really glad they like Stroman Sunbeam Bread. It's rich in calcium, protein, iron, and good B vitamins to give them that little extra spark. Stroman Sunbeam, it's the family bread. Naturally. Bright sunshine and light winds made it a rather pleasant day throughout New York State. Afternoon temperatures ranged from the upper 20s in our northern regions to the upper 40s in our area, and in Sayre it hit 50 degrees. As far as our statistics, right now the temperature at the Broome County Airport is 36 degrees. That's the official temperature. In the city it's 41 and it's 40 degrees in the suburbs. The barometer reads 30.4 and is rising. The humidity is 51%. Winds are out of the southeast at 5 miles an hour. Today we had quite a bit of sunshine. In fact, we had 96% of the available sunshine. We had absolutely no precipitation. And our temperature last night at midnight was 17 degrees, so it really warmed up today. As far as our forecast, tonight we will have increasing cloudiness, the low dropping to near 30. On Monday, it'll be cloudy with showers developing and chance of thunderstorms Monday night. The high tomorrow in the 50s during the day, the low 40 to 45. Tuesday and Wednesday, there's another chance of rain. It'll be cloudy and cooler, the high in the 50s, the low in the 30s. And in the final minute of news, March 26th is a date for a one-day course on heart disease for physicians to be held at SUNY Binghamton. Doctors interested in attending should call the Office of Continuing Education at Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse or the SUNY Clinical Campus. In Newark Valley yesterday, firemen searched for a Johnson City boy who got lost while snowmobiling. Ten-year-old Christopher Hughes was found none the worse for the experience. About 50 people protested the reinstitution of the draft yesterday in downtown Binghamton. They marched from Central High to the county courthouse and held a discussion on the issue afterwards. In Ithaca, the chairman of the Matthew McHugh re-election committee has filed a complaint with the Board of Elections against McHugh's opponent, Republican Neil Wallace. They say Wallace revealed only one part of a voter survey and is required to disclose all of it. And finally, today was the last day of ice skating at Grippen Park. A few members of the Action News crew who've been putting it off all season took to the ice this afternoon, but Ty Babylonia and Randy Gardner, they're not.
They are Susan Candiotti and Lori Vitaliano, who reportedly had to be dragged off the ice when the session ended. That's our report tonight. Tune in tomorrow at 7 for the Morning Report with Susan Candiotti. TV presents exclusive coverage of the 1980 BC Open. Tonight's highlights are brought to you by Broome County Travel Agency, Canada Dry Bottling Company of Southern New York, First City Division of Lincoln First Bank, Neslick Construction Corporation, the Owego Treadway, Felix Roma and Sons Bakery, and Schuster's Markets. Hello and welcome to Enjoy Golf Course. I'm Skip Church and along with me once again is Steve Lerman. Skip, we had an outstanding week of golf at Enjoy. And one man left Endicott with $49,500. The man who pocketed that check for $49,500 was Don Pooley. He finished the tournament here at 13 under par, capturing his first victory on the PGA Tour. But I tell you, Peter Jacobson gave him a run for his money. He finished 12 under with a fine round here on Sunday. Jacobson pocketed $29,700. Three golfers finished in a tie for third. Lee Trevino, Howard Twitty, the defending champion, and Bob Murphy, who came on quickly in the final round. Each finished 11 under, and each took home $14,300. Those men provided great excitement during the tournament. The man who was responsible for setting the stage for that excitement didn't touch a golf club all week long. He's Alex Alexander. Let's get to know the man responsible for the BC Open in this BC Open profile. I'd hate to live on the sleep that I've gotten the last three weeks for very long. It seems like Alex spends his entire life at Enjoy Golf Course making sure that BC Open Week goes off without a hitch. There are countless hours involved, and you wonder why he does it. Satisfaction. Satisfaction of being a participant in something that is a, a dream. When I go around the country, particularly to these conventions that I go to, the question is always asked, how do the people in your town do something of such a vast uh, event? How do you do it? And you know, I start to think about it, that's a pretty good question. I sometimes lay there and been wondering, how do we do it? All I know, there's one big community around here called Broome County. And by gosh, we got people from all over. Our money comes from all over that area, so forth. We all live here, and uh, that's the way I look at it. When it's all over and everybody comes up and says, particularly the players when they leave, when they say it's the finest tournament on tour, when the uh, officials from the PGA tell us that we run the best event second to none in the country, and when I look at the smiles on people's faces on Sunday night, and when they come up and say thank you for a wonderful tournament, I accept that thanks for a thousand people. And I just think that that is what I get out of it. What else is there in life? You're put on, on this earth for a very, very short time. And if all you can do when you're in here is to make the quality of life just one little bit better than when you were brought into it, what more do you want? He's just one of a thousand volunteers but he's also one of a kind. Alex Alexander, a BC Open profile. Alex and everyone involved must be pretty delighted with the tournament they've put on. It truly was an outstanding effort on their part, and we'll be back with the highlights of the tournament and a couple of golf tips for you right after this. I'm Bill Parker, letting you know that Broome County Travel is still your hometown travel agency. Whether it's honeymoons, vacations, or business trips, we take good care of people. With 14 years of travel experience, we know what you want and need. I'd just like to thank Alex and all the volunteers and all you people who came out here today. Uh, this tournament is one of my favorite tournaments, and I think all the other tournaments would do well if they took notes from the BC Open. They treat us all very well here. 
And Steve, do you have any final comments? Well, first of all, the golfers are lucky to avoid this rain we're getting caught in. <laughs> but in addition to that surprise, I think most people expected Lee Trevino to be the winner here. He went in tied for the lead. But Don Pooley, a young golfer who probably used to watch Lee Trevino on TV, now came in here, played loosely, relaxed, played a great round of golf, and took home the winner's check. It was a good round for Don Pooley. It was a good round for us. A good tournament all the way around. And the 1980 BC Open comes to an end. It's been a lot of fun. I'm Skip Church. I'm Steve Lerman. Thanks for being with us. Tonight's coverage of the 1980 BC Open was brought to you by Broome County Travel Agency, Canada Dry Bottling Company of Southern New York, First City Division of First City Bank, Neslick Construction Corporation, the Owego Treadway, Felix Roba and Sons Bakery, and Schuster's Markets. This has been an exclusive sports presentation of WBNG TV 12. Symphony office it's in the press building in downtown Binghamton if anybody wants to write and the phone number is 723-8242. 723-8242 and you have auditions tonight auditions. and tomorrow night. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us today and having a musical as we ever get except for the open and close. <laughs> Thank you for watching and I'll see you later on Action News. This has been Action WBNG TV Binghamton, New York. The Action News Morning Report with Lori Vitaliano. Good morning. A report from North Carolina on the status of Roxanne Severcool and Robert Fadden, a candidate for the Town of Union Supervisors Post, speaks up. Two brothers in the Chemung County Jail after their arrest for a 1975 murder in Long Island. And a Cornell professor says it's okay to be overweight. Mixed clouds and sunshine today with showers and a high in the low 80s. Currently 68 degrees downtown. I'll have details of these and other stories on Action News at 725. Now CBS News, Friday morning. This is Friday morning, September 5th, and from CBS News in New York, here is Bill Curtis, substituting for Bob Schieffer. Good morning. President Carter addressed the National Convention of the B'day Brith last night and emphasized his personal role in the search for Middle East peace. Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now for Action News, here's Greg Kaplan. Good afternoon, voters in the Main and Wells School District go back to the polls today. And it is the grand opening of the J.C. Penney store at the Oakdale Mall. But the big story on Action News, an industrial accident sends two people to the hospital. It happened this morning at a Southside Binghamton sewer project. Our Kerry Donovan is standing by live with details. Kerry? Well, Greg, this is the multi-million dollar sewer collection project being built along the Susquehanna River between the river and Conklin Avenue on Binghamton South Side. We're just a uh, hundred yards or so from the Exchange Street Bridge. This morning, workers from the construction company were putting some kind of a ceiling, something like you'd use like a driveway sealer, uh, that kind of material, on a sewer main that runs from this 30-foot shaft underneath where I'm standing, all the way over to the Susquehanna River. Now, we're going to find out from Assistant Chief Anthony Winkle of the Fire Department what apparently happened. Of course, your investigation, the police investigation, continues. Also with us, Assistant Police Chief uh, Justin Dyer. Ch uh, Assistant Chief Winkler, what appears to have uh, gone wrong here? Well, approximately 10.45 uh, a.m. this morning, the Binghamton Fire Department received a call for an ambulance with a man trapped in a hole here on Conklin Avenue. We immediately responded three pieces of equipment because we figured that with a man down there, we would need additional help uh, in addition to the ambulance. Uh, upon our arrival, we found that a man was trapped down in a sewer line approximately 36 inches in diameter. Uh, we had no verbal contact, or the construction crew on the scene had no verbal contact, contact with this man. Uh, we immediately uh, sent firefighters down to assess the situation. They located the men. Uh, the men were dragged over to one of the openings, and finally uh, we uh, got the men to the top. At the time, one of the men was uh, had no pulse. We administered CPR. He was taken to General Hospital. The second man did have a pulse. He was administered oxygen and taken to the hospital. Also, we have sent five of our firefighters to the hospital, hospital to be checked out 
They were covered with this substance, this toxic substance, which is a tar-like substance. Um, we sent them over because uh, a couple of them were wobbly when they came out of the holes. Our men at all times had self-contained breathing apparatus on while they were uh, during this operation. Now, just uh, Assistant Chief Dyer, uh, uh, I've been here this morning, and you could see uh, detectives and other uh, members of the police department conducting an investigation. Uh, what will be the, the nature of that investigation? Well, the investigation is, uh, of course, because of a serious nature of uh, possible injuries or possible death in a situation like this. I don't believe there's anything criminal, of course, but uh, we do investigate and uh, get the facts and determine uh, if there are any uh, violations of the law. And possibly it will be, uh, we'll call in uh, OSHA, uh, the Industrial Commission, to uh, investigate also. Uh, either one of you gentlemen, I, obviously the investigation is underway, uh, as is the work that your men are doing. Uh, uh, we, there was some thought here uh, that the man working in this tunnel uh, has an airline that goes to a face mask, something like you'd use if you were uh, working underwater, except this, of course, would be for working with a, uh, a caustic-type substance in a sewer main. Uh, there's some talk that perhaps his airline disconnected from his face mask or in some other way uh, shut off his air supply. Have you heard more on that? Uh, I haven't heard anything on that. Uh, the only information we had that uh, one of the construction workers was feeding in the line, and all of a sudden the man in the tunnel stopped pulling, and at that point they became concern and the second man went down into the tunnel. So it could be a problem, as you indicate, perhaps, or uh, it could have been a, a seizure or some other problem suffered by this individual. At this point, we have no idea what occurred. Okay, and that's why the police and the fire department of the city of Binghamton are working on this story. A uh, couple of thoughts. Thank you both, gentlemen. Appreciate sure. you staying with us. Uh, the mayor of the city is on the scene right now talking with her uh, chief public safety enforcement people, the two men that we've just been speaking with. Of course, a, a dramatic scene as the men from the fire department, particularly of the rescue squad, manned all around the top of this uh, sewer main, 30-foot shaft, and crawled from here past me all the way to the Susquehanna River trying to pull the uh, man trapped below to freedom. Eventually, they brought in a city, a, a bucket truck, a, a lifting mechanism, got a rope down on a stretcher, and were able to pull this man up out of the shaft. Now, this is the man who uh, was working. His co-worker lost contact with him, and this was the first man they brought up out of the uh, sewer shaft tunnel. And you can see as they bring him up, uh, they're, they're administering CPR, trying to bring a pulse back to this uh, individual to see if they can't resuscitate him. And this was uh, about a half hour ago on the scene, uh, uh, quite an effort to try and bring this man up out of the tunnel. As Assistant Chief Winkler pointed out, all of his men were coming up out of the shaft, coated with a copper's company, uh, substance. It's like black uh, driveway sealer, as they've been indicating to us. And both of the victims, uh, this individual uh, had a lot of protective clothing on. The co-worker who had been feeding him his oxygen line came up out of that mine shaft just coated with this stuff. And again, very dizzy, very wobbly. We watched one fire official uh, uh, come up out of the mine shaft, one of the fire rescuers. Uh, he had on, of course, all his fireman's uh, uh, gear, but he was quite covered with this material. And although able to stand on his own two feet, just tended to stagger his, his co-workers and the fire department helped him up till they got a fresh breath of air and then he was back on the scene as they try and pull this gentleman up out of the uh, sewer shaft. Again, about a 30-foot hole down to where the main line runs along underneath the river and this is where this all happened today. As uh, Assistant Chief Winkler pointed out to us during our interview, uh, they had no pulse on this man when they brought him up. Uh, we've had no indication that they've been able to revive him. Now the con company doing all of this work is based out of Rochester, New York and you can see behind me that the uh, construction workers, the few still on the scene, have packed up and they're leaving for the day. The uh, fire rescue people on the scene wrapping up their investigation, retrieving all of their equipment, and there was uh, oxygen, masks, ropes, ladders, all kinds of equipment strewn across the scene for quite some time as they struggled to bring this person out. That's the scene at this point. Greg, uh, if you have any other uh, questions or if I've missed something, please bring it up. No, I think you've covered it fairly well. I just might add to let you know that uh, at this end, we have not received any word on the conditions of the two men that were brought out or the condition of the five firemen that were uh, taken to the hospital. No word on them as of yet. Uh, if I could just jump in. Uh, we believe both victims are from the Rochester area. Uh, again, one man, uh, at last word, had not survived uh, what had happened. Again, it might have been a seizure as he was working. It might have been something that went wrong with his air supply. They'll have to investigate. And the detectives of the city of uh, Binghamton have gone to retrieve his air mask and check all of that out. Also, I'd like to point out that the other gentleman uh, with the construction company did come up uh, conscious, wobbly, 
was taken over to the hospital, but he was uh, alert and able to uh, answer questions as they brought him up out of the shack. And uh, Kerry Donovan, 12 Live, Southside Binghamton. Okay, thank you, Kerry. And, of course, we will have much more on the situation, what happened today, coming up tonight on Action News at 6. In other news this day, President Reagan hosts the Chinese president. Voters in the main Endwell School District have a decision to make today. They're deciding on what to do with the options added to the austerity budget. Our Beth Wilkinson reports. Students from the main Endwell High School took to the streets to save their after-school activities. If the sports proposition is approved, the tax rate will increase about $7 for a thousand assessed value, and the student activities program will add another $1.50. Some people say that's too much money. I'll tell you, there's a lot of uh, retired people here in this area, mm -hmm. and uh, the taxes have just gone up just too much. Beth Wilkins in Action News, and well. It'll probably come down to money in Norwich. It seems something has to be done about City Hall. Ron Greenberg tells us why. Norwich's City Hall just isn't the building it used to be. Several months ago, the city of Norwich had an opportunity to purchase this building, one that was formerly owned by Continental Telephone. But now the city faces a dilemma. It must now either renovate the old structure or be prepared to purchase a new one. Ron Greenberg, Action News, Norwich. And finally on Action News, he may not be tiptoeing through the tulips anymore, but he's still entertaining with his unique style of music. Pence Iga has a look at Tiny Tim. Meet Herbert Buckingham Corey, better known as Tiny Tim. He's on the road with the Great American Circus, entertaining audiences with the unusual Tiny Tim look and voice that brought him so much attention in the late 60s. Tiny Tim is 55 years old now. He says he's done lots of traveling, has made a movie in Australia, and will have a TV special with Ringo Starr. He wants to make it to the top of the charts again, and he has another dream, too. Well, it sounds crazy, but I really would like to go up there and out of space. I think uh, the world is open for the space age. I think we have great resources up there. I think the world tomorrow is up there. Tiny Tim says he's doing very well with the circus now, but there have been rough spots. His second marriage just ended, and he wants to lose the weight he's gained. But his philosophy of life keeps him going. You do what is right, your heart will be light, and you'll have all the blessings on earth. That saying came from a song back in 1919, called the Ten Commandments of Love. Despite being out of the limelight for so long, Tiny Tim says he never wanted to be anything but an entertainer. Pat Zyga, Action News, Oneonta. And that's our report at midday. We'll see you again tonight at 6. Until then, have yourself a really nice afternoon. Another... Afternoon newspaper bites the dust. This time it's here in Binghamton. We'll have that story and all the day's news coming up on the midday edition of Action News at Noon. But first, with his tip for the day, here's Joe Carcioni. From Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now for Action News, here's Greg Catlin. Good afternoon. Binghamton could become the rail hub of the southern tier. And some people think there should be a moratorium on building garbage incinerators. But the big story on Action News, Binghamton will be a one-paper town by October. Gannett Incorporated, which publishes the Sun Bulletin mornings and evening press afternoons, is about to end publication of one of them. Paul Daphne is at the newspaper's Vestal Publishing Plant right now. Paul? Thanks, Greg. It's been months of rumors and speculation. It's been all over the street that the newspaper was thinking to go to one newspaper. Well, now it's official. 
This is the first edition of the afternoon paper, and as you can see, it says Press Company Plans, New AM Paper. And what they're basically doing is dropping the evening press and going strictly to a morning paper. They say the name of the paper is going to be the Press and Sun Bulletin. Now, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, the publisher of the paper, Sue Clark Jackson, has called a news conference. It's expected at that time she's going to talk about this issue. Now, the paper's been moving in this direction, it would appear, for the last couple of years. Two years ago, they combined the staffs of the two newspapers, setting up bureaus, but still having the writers write for both newspapers. And it was just a little over a year ago that the Sun Bulletin changed from its tabloid form to the broadsheet form, making it more adaptable to this type of format. Now, Gannett has done this in other places in the country. Close to us, the Elmira newspaper just two years ago did the same thing. In the fall, they dropped their afternoon paper as well. So at 3 o'clock this afternoon, we expect to hear from Sue Clark Jackson, where she's expected to explain more about these plans. This is Paul Daphne, 12 Live, along the Vestal Parkway. Paul, how does the uh, National Gannett Newspaper USA Today figure into all of this? Well, Greg, locally they don't talk about it very much, but industry watchers across the nation have said that what they think Gannett is planning eventually to do is to take USA and make it its national newspaper, sell it as the national newspaper with local inserts all across the country so that people in a place like Binghamton, Elmira, Ithaca, all over the country would be getting USA Today as their morning paper with a local paper in there as well providing their local news. Okay, thank you, Paul. And, of course, we'll have more on the story after this afternoon's news conference coming up tonight on Action News at 6. From Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now for TV12's Action News, here is Jim Matthews with Mitch Gross and Bob Buchanan. Hello, here's what's happening across Susquehanna Country. Three rail cars fall off the tracks at the D&H yards in Conklin. And freedom of religion runs into Elmira City Hall. But Thursday's big story, the evening press will disappear September 27th. This region's largest selling daily newspaper will go out of existence, ending 81 years of publication. Why? The publisher says fewer people are reading afternoon newspapers. We have a series of reports. First, let's go live to Paul Daphne in Vestal, outside headquarters of the Gannett-owned Binghamton Press Company. Paul? After months of speculation, it became official today. With a front page headline, the afternoon newspaper announced its own demise. And then later in the day, about 3 o'clock, publisher Susan Clark Jackson explained why. The same phenomenon that we see elsewhere across the country. People's lifestyles are changing. When they come home from work, they'd rather go jogging, uh, play tennis, spend more time with their families. And they're just not reading afternoon papers uh, across the country. How much of a factor was TV news? None. Clark Jackson also takes full responsibility for the move. The Binghamton Press Company is managed by a team of executives with decades of experience and dedication to its community. It was here and by me that this decision was made. The publisher says nine people on the production side of the company will lose their job. She says efforts will be made to find them other jobs. No cuts are planned on the editorial side. And managing editor Dave Mack says his troops are excited. And one of the biggest reasons for the news department's enthusiasm about this is the ability that it gives us with, the, with this, the staff that we have, the reporters and editors and support staff that we have, to be much more complete, much more thorough in our treatment of each story. Clark Jackson also denies reports that her paper will someday be part of the parent company's daily, USA Today. There is not now, nor is there in the future, a plan to insert one paper into the other. They are two separate newspapers with two very separate missions. Clark Jackson also said today that they're launching an entirely new paper, a weekly that will be a giveaway. Now, she's not calling it a shopper. She says it'll be filled with new news, and it will, about 25,000 copies each week will go out to people in the triple cities. It'll be mailed to non-subscribers, probably be delivered to those that are subscribers. 
She also said that in 1986, when the parade contract is up, and this has to do with the Sunday newspaper, Parade Magazine, Gannett now owns the other type of magazine published on Sundays called Family Weekly, and they are looking into possibly going to that magazine, but that would not be until the fall of 1986. This is Paul Daphne, 12 Live on the Vessel Parkway. Paul, quickly, what about the content of the afternoon paper? For example, columns, comics, and such. Will that content be moving into the morning paper? They're saying they're calling it a marriage. They're trying to mix the things. And they say because they'll have a larger news hole, they'll have a lot of room for everything that are, is in both papers. When the subject of Dear Abby and Ann Landers, those kind of things came up, it was basically said, we haven't made those decisions yet. They haven't made decisions on things like comics and such either. They seem to have, have made the decision that they're going to go, but all the details aren't yet ironed out. Paul Daphne, live at the Binghamton Press Company. Well, some evening press paper carriers don't like the idea of losing their paper routes. The afternoon delivery kids got a letter today. It tells them they'll become Press Sun Bulletin morning carriers. The afternoon carriers can take over a morning route, leaving a current morning carrier without a job. Our Greg Kathleen found many of them don't like it. I don't really like it because, you know, it's just like more dangerous for us to do in the morning than in the afternoon because there's not as much people around. And I don't know, I don't really want to do it in the morning because school's going to be starting earlier. What do you think about having to get up in the morning instead of the afternoons now? Uh, I can't do it. <laughs> no? No. <laughs> I'm not the kind of kid that gets up in the morning. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's much fair. I think that we should still keep on delivering it. There are about 2,000 paper carriers. The publisher says none of them should be forced out of their routes because of attrition. Well, I went to downtown Binghamton today to ask passers-by what they think of the decision to eliminate the afternoon paper. Oh, I like an evening paper also. Does that mean they're going to stop at uh, the no afternoon paper at all? No afternoon paper at all. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I'd rather have it in the evening than in the morning. I usually watch the paper after I get home, you know, read the paper after I get home from school. And I usually like sit down, read my paper, do the homework, and I'll probably miss it. I don't like the idea. I work days and I enjoy reading the evening paper at night. Um, the Sun Bulletin, unless they improve it, it doesn't have as much news as the evening press did. So if there's an improvement in the morning paper, maybe, but I like the evening paper. Well, I think it's crazy. I love the press. They decided that it apparently is uh, I don't two papers you. are too much. I don't believe you. <laughs> I, I usually buy the evening press because the the morning press doesn't have as much information in it. You know? This is WBNG-TV, Binghamton, Elmira. From Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now for TV12's Action News, here's Jim Matthews with Carl Ravitch and Bob Buchanan. Hello, here's what the Action News teams learned this Monday. Broome County's Catholic schools launch a recruiting drive. This is the first day for cameras in Broome County courtrooms. And the price tag for arena roof repairs may be climbing. But the big story on Action News, an Oneida Indian power struggle goes to Binghamton Federal Court. Federal marshals are being ordered to oust Oneida Indians from Canada who are holding a reservation bingo parlor near Utica. Veronica McQuillan has the story. The Oneida Indian Territory between Syracuse and Utica is the scene of a bitter dispute between two rival groups. Members of the group that's now in control sent a representative to court. He told Judge Thomas McAvoy that this was strictly an internal Indian affair and that the court had no jurisdiction in the case. But the first group of Oneidas held their ground. The injunction was granted. Veronica McQuillan, Action News at the Federal Courthouse in Binghamton. In Broome County Court today, a trucker is on trial for criminally negligent homicide in the highway death of a town of Shenango Man. Paul Daphne has the story. Colin Fairchild was turning his truck around on Route 12 about 3 a.m. June 14 last year. Donald Haskell was headed north. Everyone agrees it was foggy. Haskell slammed into the truck and was killed. Fairchild is now on trial for criminally negligent homicide as a result of the accident. The prosecution wrapped up its case in a little over two hours. The defense takes over in the morning. Paul Daphne, Action News, Binghamton. 
Over the past two months, we brought you trials from Chemung County covered by cameras in the courtroom. The trial of Donald Haskell that Paul Daphne just told us about is the first in Broome County. Paul's with us now to give his first day impressions of cameras in Broome's courts. Paul, at first there was a lot of discussion that this would be a disruptive factor and that the, the, the proceedings would just not work with cameras in the courtrooms. It looked pretty good today. It's no problems at all. I talked with a couple of the attorneys and they say, yeah, at the beginning you're, you're aware of it, but once you get started, it's nothing. They ignored it. Nobody paid attention to the camera in any way specifically at all. It was very unobtrusive, off to the side, out of view of everybody. Behind the witnesses, the witnesses couldn't even see it at all. Isn't there a good argument that we will now be helping people to go someplace where they might not necessarily go unless they're, unless they're called for jury duty or involved in a, in a legal action of some sort? Yeah, I think that's one of the big advantages of, of cameras in the courtroom. From my own experience, I've had people talk to me outside a courtroom saying, can I go in there? And I say, of course you can. The only reason I can go in there is because you can go in there. It's the right of the public to be in the courtroom. And I think the cameras will help people. They'll see the courtroom now. So if they end up being at a trial, they're not going to be frightened by it as much. It's going to be something they're going to see every day. It kind of takes the mystique away a little bit. I know some people in the judicial system don't think that's a good idea yeah. to take away the mystique. I think it is because it's All going right. to open it up. For everybody. On the devil's advocate side of all of this, are we doing something that uh, is going to be uh, uh, construed to be pick and choose by virtue of uh, whoever makes the decisions in the news business? That is to say, will we be deciding which trials are, quote, juicy enough for us to go and cover and uh, perhaps uh, giving exposure to a defendant who's still innocent until proven guilty, uh, an exposure that he wouldn't otherwise have? I don't think it changes. We've always picked which trials we're going to cover. We always have. Television always has. So has so a print journalist. Everybody's always chosen which, which trials to cover. And all this is going to change is the way we're covering them. Actually, it becomes more work for the reporter because we now have to take all those tapes and go through them to come up with the actual words that are being said. It's not just walk out, look at my notes, and tell you what was said in court today. I now have to go through all those tapes and find that material. Okay. We shot the person, the defendant going into the trial before. Now we happen to shoot him sitting at a defense table. The information is the same, just the images are added. That's all. All right, Paul, thank you. Well, Super Bowl 22 is in the books. Carl Ravage is here to take a look at what happened last. What did happen last night? I'm was not a, sure uh, I understand. A typical uh, Super Bowl <laughs> that we've seen in the past three years. In Washington today, they're singing hail to the chief. In this case, the chief of the Redskins, quarterback Doug Williams. The first black player to start a Super Bowl at that position, and probably, as far as I know, the first player ever to have root canal surgery just 24 hours before the big game. Nothing was going to phase the big right-hander, even a tremendous Denver start. Their first offensive play from scrimmage, John Elway throws the bomb to Ricky Nateel, the quickest touchdown in history of the Super Bowl, 7-0 Denver. And finally tonight, the ultimate in congratulatory expression. That is, of course, to be on the cover of the Wheaties box. With their Super Bowl victory yesterday, the Redskins achieved that milestone. In Buffalo today, 200,000 of the boxes bearing the champion's pictures churned out. Only the second team to be featured on the cover, the other, the Minnesota Twins. But these boxes are hard to come by. We're uh, only going to print one million cartons, that's one million of, of the boxes, for exclusive distribution in the Washington, D.C. area. One million. And, uh, the did, they, did they have the thing all set up to print Denver boxes? They did. And as a matter of fact, uh, during that interview, he said uh, those were all destroyed. That's all right. And they made them. All right. Thank you, Carl. Sure. Up ahead on Action News, Tuesday's forecast day for Punxsutawney Phil. Will it be more winter or an early spring? And break out the rain gear. Bob will have the latest weather word after these words. Well, it's that time of year again. A snoozing Punxsutawney Phil will soon be rudely awakened to decide just how much winter is left. Tomorrow, the 101st repeat of a long-standing tradition. Phil will be uh, making an appearance. If he sees a shadow, six more weeks of winter will follow. No shadow and spring right around the bend. The record book shows that Phil has seen his shadow all but six times. Day-long list of events and happenings planned for Punxsutawney, PA tomorrow. Around here, this fog laying in the, in the valleys, patches of snow here and there, and rain on and off pretty much all day. That's right. Strange kind of day. Yes. Uh, record tying uh, high temperatures, but a lot of fog. In fact, there's a fog advisory in for a good deal of the area in eastern New York, so if you're not driving around tonight, don't. Uh, right now, it is just cloudy, and it's foggy also at Link Field, and it's still 49 degrees up there. Amazing temperatures. Winds out of the south at 9 miles an hour. 
Highs will be in the 20s and the lows in the teens will drop to the 0 to 10 above range. Ooh, back to that again. Uh, yeah, yes, oh, back no. to that again. Well, we'll see. Thanks, Bob. Up ahead on Action News, the American Legion has a beef with Pat Schroeder. We'll tell you more in a minute. Once again, the ratings prove. WBNG-TV is the most affordable advertising medium in the Binghamton market. For every dollar spent, WBNG can deliver your advertising message to over 500 adults. Newspapers can't do that. Radio, cable, and billboard advertising can't provide the cost efficiency of TV-12. And we have a plan for every budget, large or small. So let us help build your business. Call the TV-12 sales team. And let's, let's talk, talk television. television. These stories also making the Monday evening action news. The Women, Infants, and Children's Program, operated by Opportunities for Shenango, will take applications for supplemental food at several locations through February. Coming up tonight on Action News at 11, some Owego residents plant protest plans to put up a shopping center on part of the Tioga County Fairgrounds. And members of the SUNY Binghamton Latin American Solidarity Committee make it clear how they want Congressman Matthew McHugh to vote on Contra Aid. And finally this evening, is there a public relations nightmare brewing for Congresswoman Patricia Schroeder? The Colorado representative was pictured on the cover of Ms. Magazine recently with an American flag draped over her shoulder like a shawl. The American Legion, a three million member veterans group, calls that picture an outrage. Schroeder says the complaints are a difference of opinion about how to show respect for the American flag. That's the early edition of Action News right after the minute. For Bob Buchanan, Carl Ravitch, the Action News team and the crew, I'm Jim Matthews. Thanks for having us in. We'll see you tonight at 11. From Susquehanna Country's largest and most highly acclaimed broadcast news organization, this is Action News. And now, for TV-12's Action News, here is Jim Matthews with Bob Buchanan and John LeCompte. Hello, during the next half hour, the Action News team wants you to know tax reform buries a proposed uh, meatpacking plant. The nightmare at Binghamton's Water Street parking ramp may soon be resolved. And Senator Robert Dole talks about the farm crisis. But the big story tonight, Action News reporter Veronica McQuillan learned that a big economic development project planned for eastern Broome County has apparently collapsed. Veronica has the details on the story from Deposit. A meatpacking plant won't be built near Deposit this year and may never be built. Harp says plans to put a meatpacking plant here were on hold all summer while the company waited to see what the final version of tax reform would look like. Now that the bill has been signed, Harp says it's clear the company's original financial plan just won't work. Asked if the company would consider another financial plan, Harp said no decision had been made yet. In deposit, about a mile and a half from their proposed plant site, officials said that if the plant is not built, it will mean the loss of one to three hundred jobs and the probable loss of several million dollars in state and federal money. Mayor Martin Backrack says many are disappointed. It was overwhelming, the people that wanted it here, to the people that had their doubts about it and about the way it was going to be built. And it was very disappointing when uh, we got the news that he was going to reconsider. Veronica McQuillan, Action News, Deposit. A fire at noontime guts a Main Street apartment building in Johnson City. Our Greg Kaplan was there as the units fought the flames. What started as a smoky blaze quickly turned into a raging inferno. Firefighters from Johnson City, Endicott, and elsewhere fought the flames for a good part of the afternoon. It's the old E&H Grocery, now a three-story apartment building, now destroyed. People who live in the building say it started in the second floor apartment of Kathy Skiba, apparently in her son's bedroom. Skiba was taken to the hospital with leg burns. Well, the owner of Boscov's department store has argued it's tough to make a buck because of problems at the Water Street parking ramp in downtown Binghamton. But now, as Paul Daphne tells us, City Hall hopes it has a solution to a high-volume headache. The Water Street parking garage was originally built for all-day parking. It's now the busiest in the city because it's right next to the city's largest department store, Boscov's. 
This is the second level of the parking garage. It's the only place where in the middle they don't have a down ramp right next to an up ramp. So what's going to happen is they're going to take where this car is parked and build an up ramp. The entrance will also be moved from the middle to the southern end, next to Boss Cobbs. So instead of traffic coming in, turning right, and going around in big circles, once you enter, you'll go right up a ramp and travel clockwise, never passing the middle on your way up. The down ramps will all be on the northern end and will take traffic counterclockwise. Meantime, Schweitzer Aircraft is hoping that the unusual combination of a hot economy and a flood control project will spell financial success for years to come. Nancy Harrison has that story from Shimon County. Employees at Schweitzer Aircraft and Big Flats have their work cut out for them. Business is brisk this year. This year will be probably one of the best years we've ever had in the company's history. Things are going quite well. And there's talk of expansion down the road. But Schweitzer is keeping its head above water in more than one way. A dike will be built around the facility to protect the plant from nearby Sing Sing Creek, which overflows when it rains. And finally, 24 hours later, and they're still a running. Members of the Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity at SUNY Binghamton started a run around campus yesterday to raise money for the American Cancer Society. Mostly a male activity, but even some of the ladies joined in for the final lap with the frat guys. A day after the first few steps, the finish line made of toilet paper was broken, and their goal was reached. Between $1,500 and $2,000, probably yeah! When everything comes in, that's just a uh, rough estimate. Who ran at night, you might ask? Well, the new pledges got that detail, but at 5 o'clock, it was time to kick back and relax. It's uh, 5 o'clock now, it's Friday. What are you guys going to do? Party! Party! Ah, to be 18 again. <laughs> that's the early edition of Action News right up to the minute. For John LeCompte, the Action News team, the crew, I'm Jim Matthews. Thanks for having us in. Now the area's most complete hour of information continues. IBM Endicott developed a new computer chip for your television cable box. The company says the new chip is going to change the way we use our television sets. Action News reporter Michael Benny explains. It sits near most of our television sets, and we rarely think about it. But what else would you like your cable TV box to do? I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't think I know what I would have it do. Start thinking, because the cable box is about to become a whole lot more. IBM Endicott has developed this new computer chip. Right now, your cable box looks like this. The new chip replaces all these chips... Michael Benny, Action News. Although the new chip was developed in Endicott, it will not be manufactured there. That work will be done in Vermont. IBM says you should start seeing major changes like the ones Michael talked about within the next four years. Taiwan County man is charged with stealing money from a fund set up for a nine-year-old boy with cancer. State police say that Edward Merrick of Spencer stole more than $1,000 from the Justin Ford Benefit Fund. Troopers say that Merrick coordinated a benefit spaghetti dinner for the Van Etten boy, but now he's accused of pocketing some of the proceeds. Merrick is charged with grand larceny. An historic bridge in Tioga County is back open for drivers tonight. The State Department of Transportation closed the Court Street Bridge in Owego for a safety inspection earlier today. Workers tested for stress, strain, and how the weight of vehicles affects the bridge. The results of today's inspection will not be available for a few weeks. Although it is safe for traffic now, state inspectors say the bridge will eventually need serious repair. So the next step is to figure out what to do with the Court Street Bridge. Local lawmakers are working with the New York State Department of Transportation on several options, and Action News reporter Rich David shows us what they're considering. Turfmaster is a mix of real grass and synthetic fibers and allows many different types of sports to be played on it. The stadium will also be home to all Seton Catholic home games. Well, Mother Nature gave us a scare over the weekend, but thankfully the snow has been replaced by sunny skies. Meteorologist Dr. Bill Rogers is live at Binghamton Municipal Stadium with more.
Candace, the sun is out. It's just not working very well. It's kind of chilly out here. The fans are prepared, though. They got heavy jackets. I'll have more after a quick break. Meteorologist Dr. Bill Rogers, the area's most experienced meteorologist. Weeknights at 5, 5, 36, and 11 on WBNG-TV Action News, your news leader. We are live from the studios of WBNG-TV, where for the next half hour, we will be scheduling free heart risk screening assessments for women. Right now, I'm joined by Dr. Felice Reitnick, Guthrie Heart Surgeon, and Dr. Stephanie Goodwin, Guthrie Cardiologist. Dr. Goodwin, what is the Women's Healthy Heart Center at Guthrie? This is a program that is specifically designed to meet the heart care needs of women. It is both an educational and prevention piece for those women who have documented heart disease or those who may be at risk for heart disease. But Dr. Reitnick, is heart disease a serious concern for women? Yes, heart disease in women is a silent epidemic. It's the number one killer of women. Okay. Yeah, it's a big thing. And right now, we're offering a free screening. And the statistics seem to speak for themselves. We urge you to call 729-3222 to schedule the important heart risk assessment that we're offering today. 729-3222. It's sunny, but a bit breezy this evening down at the ballpark, and that's where we find meteorologist Dr. Bill Rogers. Candace, it's not too bad out in the sun. Pretty warm. Temperatures are in the upper 40s and lower 50s. In the shade, though, it is quite chilly, especially when you factor in a cold northerly wind. Around the region right now, temperatures are primarily in the 40s, dew points in the 30s. Our winds are from a cold northwesterly direction at about 15 miles an hour, and a ball just landed about 7 feet from me. If I would have been facing the other way, I could have caught it. Darn. Barometric pressure right now is on the rise. Across the region, satellite indicates fair skies. That's why we're seeing the sunshine, and across the area we will see more tomorrow. In fact, temperatures are going to be a little bit warmer across the region tomorrow. Doppler indicating the showers moving out of the region. Earlier today we had a few around the area, and it looks like we're going to see mostly fair skies over the next couple of days. Temperatures, they're looking like this. Fairly cool, 40s. You can see a little bit better. New York City at 55, 48 at Buffalo, 51 at Pittsburgh. Across the nation, quite warm across the deep south. You'll notice some cool temperatures across the northeast. Otherwise, back west, it's even starting to warm up with 50s and 60s, 80s across southern portions of Texas. Satellite, the past 12 hours, like this. Clouds moving out, high pressure moving in. That means sunny skies this afternoon. But tonight, clear and very cool. Cool temperatures dropping down into the middle and upper 20s below the freezing mark. Dress warm, cover up the tender vegetation if you've started early. You don't want to have to start over. As we look at the Doppler summary, indicating some showers moving out of the northeast, but across the west, they're seeing scattered showers with a few snow showers in the higher elevations across California, Nevada, and California. Now, many were asking about the storm tracker homework question. We'll continue it again. How much snow do we usually see in April on an average? five inches. We had a little bit of that around the area last night. Tonight, not cold enough. Well, not any snow, but it is going to be cold enough. We'll see temperatures drop down into the middle and upper 20s. I'm calling for a low of 28 with mostly clear and cold conditions. Tomorrow across the area, plenty of sunshine. A nice day. A little bit warmer than today as well. Look for a high of about 51. And tomorrow night, we can expect Fair skies, quite cool again, but not quite as cold. An overnight low of 31 degrees. Five-day forecast, temperatures are going to be mild the next couple of days. Actually at or above average by a couple of degrees. Towards the end of the week, though, a little bit of a change coming up. Some scattered showers on Friday and on Saturday with slightly cooler temperatures. Highs in the middle and upper 40s Friday and Saturday. Overnight lows a little bit warmer, middle and upper 30s. The next couple of nights, though, looks like it's going to be quite chilly. Overnight lows dropping down below the freezing mark, but around the daytime hours we can expect plenty of sunshine in mild conditions at or above normal. You can't ask better than that this time of the year. And a reminder that last night, a little bit of snow. Candace, no snow tonight, but chilly. If you're coming out, bring a jacket and you'll be okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bill. And as you can see, the B-Mets are playing their home opener tonight against the Portland Sea Dogs. Action Sports Director Michael Barkless is there and tells us how they're doing. Michael? Candace, it seems like it's been a long off season. Well, it really hasn't. Big up the Mets in action. We'll update the game and tell you the rest of the day in sports right after this.
when the Binghamton Mets come home, the fans come out to the stadium. And that's where we find Action Sports Director Michael Barclays. Michael, a score yet in the home opener? Candace, a score indeed, but it's, uh, it's a bad score. Mets are trailing one nothing after uh, after a half inning of play, but the Binghamton Mets just stepped to the plate. They're looking to take their cuts, hopefully get to the Sea Dogs pitching staff, put some runs on the board. You know they do have the potential of scoring a lot of runs this season, a lot of young power in the lineup, a lot of guys that enjoy stealing bases. So we'll just have to wait and see what kind of seasons we're going to have. But Binghamton Mets coming into the home opener 0 and 3, hoping to turn it around. They've got a long home stand playing the Sea Dogs tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. Just maybe they'll get a win or two. Or three. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let's talk about the Big League Club. After playing seven games on the road to start the year, the New York Mets finally showed up at Shea today. And they had some good news, bad news for their fans. The good news is the Mets come in 5-2. and two, Not a bad record. But the bad news is both Mike Piazza along with Rick Reed have been placed on the 15-day disabled list after suffering injuries over the weekend in Montreal. Well, that news also means that Rico Beltran and former Binghamton Met Terrence Long got the call up from Norfolk as the Mets hosted the Marlins at home. And Tom, terrific. Tom Seaver doing first pitch honors and oh yeah, looking good, huh? All right, let's pick it up. Former Binghamton Met Bobby Jones pitching for New York and getting some help from Robin Ventura at third. A great one-handed pickup to nail Luis Castillo at first. Then Jones helps himself at the plate. Fifth inning, taking LeVon Hernandez over the wall for Jones' his first professional home run. Mets take a 2-1 lead. Now let's go to the fifth. It's 3-1 New York when Ventura does it with his bat. Going deep to straightaway center, and this thing just misses. Leaving the ballpark. Add two more ribbies for Ventura. He now leads the team with nine runs batted in. The Mets looking mighty good at home. They win it. Eight to one. What do you say we go over to the American League? We take you to historic Tiger Stadium. And it's the final home opener there ever. Starting next a season, Detroit's going to play at Comericare Park, the new site just a few blocks away from the old stadium and the old park open play in 1912. Tigers and Twins in what would be a pitcher's duel. It goes extra innings where finally Minnesota breaks through. They win it 1-0 as they play into the 12th. Well, he was the BC Iceman's most consistent player this past season. You know, he never complained about an injury, never wanted to be taken out of the lineup. He played all 79 games for the BC Iceman. He wore the C of the captain with pride, and today he's honored by the club. That's right, Captain Greg Pager named the Iceman's most valuable player. The award was voted on by his teammates and handed out today. The Brantford, Ontario native posted career highs in goals and assists by leading the Iceman with 40 goals and 82 points. Pager was also BC's leading scorer. He wins that trophy, uh, his 82 points, seven better than Patrice Robitaille. Other award winners today as we check the list, they are uh, Pete Vandermeer. He earned the team's seventh player award. The Iceman's best defenseman award given to Yevgeny Shaldibin. He scored 41 goals and 38 assists in 61 games. And the community service trophy goes to Mark Dudium. He was very active in the Southern Tier with various visits to schools and charitable organizations. Congratulations to all of the Iceman's award winners at today's function. And finally, I'll tell you what, golf's first major of the year is in the books for another year. The Masters Championship goes to Spain's Jose Maria Olafable. He held off the charge yesterday to win his second green jacket in what was a thrilling Masters, but I got to take you back to Augusta just for a moment because you got to check out the shot of a lifetime. I mean, take a look at this thing. Comes off the blade of Davis Love the third. He is off the green, he sends it into the bank, and he's using that, that ridge kind of as a backstop, and it just keeps on rolling and rolling and rolling. <laughs> and next thing you know, the thing is in the bottom of the cup. That's how you score a birdie, I suppose. Just an amazing golf shot. Davis Love the third came close to winning the Masters yesterday, but just came up two strokes short as Jose Maria Olafable captures the green jacket. But I just had to show you that shot again because... It's things I only dream of. I know. There were a lot of amazing shots, though, really, at the Masters yesterday. Yeah, Candice, there really was. Also, a lot of shots that you, you just wouldn't expect to see there. Greg Norman was 90 yards away from the green, and he puts his shot into the bunker. So, an exciting Masters. Jose Maria Lafabo wins. We are finished one inning, though, here at the stadium. The Mets are down one nothing. We'll tell you how it turns out tonight at 11. Hopefully, they'll turn it around. Hopefully. Thanks, All right. Well, visitors from Borovici, Binghamton's sister city in Russia, are here visiting. Binghamton welcomed the Russians with a cake and a gift. And we'll have more about the purpose of the visit next.
The Southern Tier is hosting visitors from our sister city in Russia this week. They're from an orphanage in Borovici and they're meeting with child care leaders here. The goal is to compare the differences and similarities between the two child care systems. Yeah. For the future, we see uh, exchanges uh, of experience, exchanges of uh, work, and also not exchanges of adults and specialists, but also children's home uh, children as well. This is the 10th anniversary of Binghamton's participation in the Sister City program. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Action News at 6. I'm Candace Chapman. Be sure to join us tonight for Action News at 11. Breaking news. We're committed to bring it to you first, fast, and live. That's why WBNG TV Action News has Live Eye, the area's only satellite news gathering unit. Live Eye allows us to bring you the news you need live from the scene. We're live here where police do have the scene completely. Whenever, wherever, there's news. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have new information on this breaking story. WBNG TV's Live Eye. Look for it. Another exclusive from WBNG TV Action News, your news leader.